Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to Seoul, Korea. Yeah. Uh, just you listen, uh, that music is uh, uh, traditional music, Arirang. Now uh, music is BTS. Uh, it uh, is uh, a little bit hint of the uh, evolution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, this time, uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Byung Gil Kim uh, from Sungyungwan University of the uh, uh, School of Medicine, uh, Seoul. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I wanted to thank you all uh, of you uh, to joining us here today uh, to a very, very exciting discussion on three E's of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors in endometrial cancer. Uh, yeah. Uh, we will discuss emergence and evolution and expansion of the uh, and combination of the immune checkpoint inhibitors and their impact uh, on outcomes of endometrial cancer patients. This is a disclaimer for our uh, meetings. Yeah, this is a very uh, good privilege to... Uh, uh, here today uh, with uh, Jung Yun Lee from uh, Yonsei University College of Medicine who will be discussing the first E, which is the emergence of the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors in advanced recurrent endometrial cancer, and Mansur uh, Raza Mizura, uh, Mirza from Copenhagen University Hospital, will be discussing the latest advances in the evolution of immune checkpoint inhibitors in combination with uh, chemotherapy. And uh, lastly, David Tan from the National University Cancer Institute in Singapore we'll discuss where we go from here by discussion uh, the expansion of immune checkpoint inhibitors with other combination in endometrial cancer patients. Uh, I will open the uh, discussion by talking about uh, the foundation of endometrial cancer uh, management landscape. Uh, I will... Uh, uh, walk you through the unmet needs and uh, current guidelines and how the current endometrial cancer treatment landscape is changing with all the exciting uh, data readout and approvals that are beginning to come through. This is uh, my disclosure. Yeah, this is a little bit uh, busy slides, but uh, yeah. When we look back uh, 20 years, uh, 2004, uh, the uh, treatment of the advanced endometrial cancer patients are uh, triplet uh, chemotherapy. But uh, it shows a uh, uh, poor outcome and uh, very high toxicity. And 2012, uh, we, uh, the JOJ209 uh, trial uh, has proven the uh, doublet chemotherapy, uh, paclitaxel carboplatin shows similar efficacy and uh, very low toxicity. So uh, that is the standard of care uh, from that time. Uh, around that uh, same time, uh, as you know uh, very well, TCG was uh, reported. So TCG uh, shows uh, there is uh, at least four molecular subclassifications. Uh, uh, in endometrial cancer. So uh, there is a major foot step forward to understand that, that uh, the endometrial cancer is not only one disease. Uh, there is at least four uh, subtypes, molecular subtypes. So uh, these molecular subtypes lead to uh, the introduction of the uh, monotherapy treatment uh, in 2017, uh, pembrolizumab uh, was uh, approved uh, as a first agent. Uh, in previously, 
treated solid tumors with mismatched repair defect. Promisey uh, further refined the insights to, from uh, TCJ how we evaluate endometrial cancer. So then, uh, 2021, we saw uh, approval of dostalimab for previously uh, treated uh, endometrial cancer, which uh, has defective mismatch repair. Uh, this is a very important uh, step forward in the same, in the same year. Uh, the combination of pembrolizumab and lenbatinib uh, also approved for uh, previously treated uh, non-DMML uh, endometrial cancer patients. Most recently, uh, this year, we saw uh, the approval of dostalimab plus cowplatin paclitaxel for primary advanced uh, or recurrent endometrial cancer in United States and United Kingdom in addition to a positive CHAMP guidance from European uh, med medicine agency. But uh, we are not uh, finished uh, uh, with, uh, yet with our journey, as many ongoing trials uh, may further improve uh, outcomes for endometrial cancer patients. Yeah, as you know, the incidence and the mortality of endometrial cancer continue to rise. Uh, Endometrial cancer is the sixth most common uh, cancer in women worldwide, and uh, uh, 417,367 new endometrial cancer cases were recorded in uh, 2010 globally. Uh, among them, about 40% of uh, patients uh, occurs in Asia. And uh, from 2020 to 2040, endometrial cancer mortality in Asia will increase by 60% uh, in coming years. So there are huge unmet needs of, uh, to improve uh, uh, treatment uh, method. Yeah, uh, this is uh, uh, Pan-Asian Adapted ESMO guidelines for recurrent endometrial cancer. So uh, this is algorithm, but uh, you can see the most important key uh, uh, recommendation include uh, we should perform uh, molecular uh, classification regardless of any uh, histologic type. So that is the important thing. And uh, the other one is uh, according to uh, molecular uh, profiling, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor should be uh, used uh, and considered uh, in patients with a recurrent and metastatic disease. But uh, these guidelines also uh, needs uh, updating uh, given the recent uh, practice changing data you will see soon that we have seen in uh, first line setting uh, this year. Uh, this is uh, Japan Society of Gynecology Oncology uh, Guideline, uh, 2018. Actually, uh, they uh, revised uh, the guideline this year, but uh, not published yet. Uh, but uh, at that time, uh, they did not include the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor at that time. But uh, we expect, uh, anticipated, uh, in this uh, year version, we can see uh, immune-based uh, treatment should be incorporated. Yeah, this is the uh, Korean Society of Gynecology Oncology uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, very similar, but uh, unresectable metastatic tumors and recurrent tumors, main treatment is uh, uh, chemotherapy. So it, at this time also, uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors are not included. But uh, as I know, uh, this, uh, this year, uh, Korean society also uh, updated the guidelines. Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, prepared in uh, Korean language. So soon, maybe this uh, next year, we can see uh, English version uh, publication 
uh, next year. And in that guideline, uh, we can see the incorporation of the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors in uh, metastatic and uh, recurrent tumors. Yeah, uh, as mentioned previously, uh, pan Asian uh, as, uh, as diagnostic algorithm for integrated uh, molecular classification uh, is uh, like this. Uh, so, uh, which the, uh, uh, screen all uh, endometrial cancer uh, patients with uh, uh, this molecular classification, DMMR and P53 uh, mutation should be carried out regardless of histologic uh, types. Uh, so uh, utilizing these uh, methods, uh, we can pro provide uh, integrated uh, diagnosis uh, shown in this uh, algorithm. Uh, yeah, and the, with the, uh, these findings, uh, I, will, I would like to hand over uh, to Jung Yun Lee uh, to work us uh, through the uh, next section. Please. Welcome to Seoul. Uh, this is a really exciting time uh, in GI and oncology field. And many things rapidly changed. And in the center of the innovation, immune checkpoint inhibitor uh, has a role. So I will talk about the emergence of immune checkpoint inhibitor, monotherapy, and TKI combination for treatment of advanced and recurrent endometrial cancer. Uh, these are my disclosures. I think you should uh, turn off my, my own microphones. Operation team, could you please turn off? Yes. Uh, as you know, chemotherapy uh, does not work in recurrent endometrial cancer who failed prior chemotherapy. Uh, before the introduction of immune checkpoint inhibitor, we just treated the patient with carbotaxol as frontline. And if patient recurred after carbotaxol, then we, we used uh, weekly paclitaxel, uh, liposomal doxorubicin or doxorubicin. And we all know the, the single agent chemotherapy uh, objective response rate is around 10% with median PFS of three months the decimal prognosis for those patients. And uh, I will introduce one case from, uh, uh, from Canada. And 61-year-old woman after a staging operation, and she had a liquor uh, on uh, March 2016 with MMR deficient recurrent grade three endometrial cancer and she uh, received uh, six cycles of carbotaxel and second line pedulated pedi liposomal doxorubicin. However, uh, chemotherapy does not work well and she continued extensive progression. And uh, we, they tried palliative radiation but failed and she suffered from severe pain with progression. If they, this patient uh, came to us uh, 10 years ago, then we don't have option anymore. So we just uh, relieve the pain and uh, offer the best supportive care. But many things are changed. Uh, for those patients, patient enrolled in an anti-PD-1 clinical trial, which is Garnet, after repeated treatment failure with chemotherapy. So uh, as you see the image, there were multiple seeding nodule and invading uh, uh, retroperitoneum, and there were many uh, metastatic tumors. And what happens to her? She uh, showed complete remission within one year of anti-PD-1 therapy, and she uh, remained in complete remission after therapy, 
and five years later, she remains disease-free. This is a magical story. Uh, for rational for immune checkpoint inhibitor monotherapy, we have uh, two evidences. First one is Garnet, and second one is Keynote 158. We all know the objective response rate was around 50% in those studies. And the, the most important thing is, you, you, you see the PFS curve, then after 12 months, there is few events. That means durable responses. If patient uh, receive immune checkpoint inhibitor and have responses, then that means durable responses. So that is very important. Uh, what about MMRP, MSS patient? We have uh, some studies. Uh, very interestingly, Garnett showed some uh, responses in MMRP patient also. So objective response rate was 15% with median PFS uh, three months. And uh, Keynote 775 compared the uh, Lembatini plus Pembrolizumab uh, with uh, Doxorubicin or Carboplatin, uh, Doxorubicin or Paclitaxel. And we, uh, we, we, we can see that uh, objective response rate is around 30% and uh, PFS is uh, around seven months. Uh, when you look at the survival curve from Keynote 775, then uh, in, in MMRP patient, then uh, Lemba plus Pembrolizumab showed uh, seven months of PFS and 18 months of OS. So now uh, look at the anti-PD-1 in uh, Asian patient population. Uh, many of the audience uh, already uh, have experience about the anti-PD-1s in your practice, but I, I would like to share my experience in, in patient. 50-year-old uh, uh, woman and stage 3C2 grade 3 endometrioid endometrial cancer. Uh, she had a staging operation in uh, 19, uh, 2019 and six cycles of carbotaxol followed by radiation. However, uh, after soon, she had multiple uh, metastases, multiple liver metastases. And she uh, came to my clinic. I uh, checked the liver biopsy, and I found that she had uh, MMR deficient. So uh, her molecular profile is MRH1 loss and P53 abnormal type, HER2-1 positive. But uh, in this case, I think P53 uh, is a passenger. I mean, the MMR deficient is a driver, and P53 was followed by MMR deficient. So we uh, started uh, and treated patient with anti-PD-1, and as you see the image, there were multiple liver metastases, and started to response, and partial remission, and after uh, six months later, the tumor shrinks and disappeared, which means complete remission. And then three years later, she still remains disease-free. Uh, you can check the uh, e-poster uh, of a uh, Korean EAP uh, study, and dostalimab demonstrated encouraging anti-tumor activity in Korean patient with MMRD endometrial cancer. We found that objective response rate around 50%, which is comparable with other uh, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor studies, MMR deficient. And also we found that uh, the, the response is quite durable, but uh, this is small number and short-term follow-up, we need uh, more maturation for that. However, we, we can quite convincing uh, and, uh, for the activity of immune checkpoint inhibitor in those patients. Uh, now I will tell you uh, safety profile of anti-PD-1. So uh, two cases I showed you, uh, the patient had a similar, tox had a similar toxicity. Uh, patient developed astralgia, and that was relieved by steroid. 
So anti-PD-1 is capable of durable responses and similar pro safety profile was observed in case studies one and two. And we treat new symptoms arising during immune checkpoint in treatment with suspicion and possibly related to treatment until proven otherwise. So uh, I would like to emphasize early recognition of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor adverse events and prompt treatment and multidisciplinary approach is important. Um, because uh, arthritis can be from many other origins. So for my patient, I consulted to rheumatologist for the exclude rheumatoid arthritis and rheumatologist tested many things and they uh, they can say, they could say that that is not the rheumatoid arthritis. This is from uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor. So we started steroid and her symptom was easily relieved. Uh, now I will uh, about panel discussion. So uh, we, uh, many of audience already have experience about the IR, managing IRAE, but we can hear from the other experts from uh, this. So uh, from David, could you please share the experience about IRAE, including arthritis and pneumonitis, hepatitis, anything you can share? With audience. So, yeah, so thanks, thanks for uh, that question. I think, you know, this is a really important question because while, you know, IO is transforming the way we manage cancers, it is important to know that these drugs can be associated with toxicity and sometimes very severe toxicity as well. And the key to managing this is early recognition. And that means when you see, when you talk to your patients about giving these drugs, you've got to explain to them from the beginning what to expect, what the red flags are, and when to report those symptoms when they experience it as well. On our end, what we've done within our institution is set up an IR toxicity team. So we have named doctors and attending physicians for each organ system that may be affected by patients on IO. So we've got an endocrinologist, a hepatologist, cardiac, doctor who's very, very focused on managing patients with IO-related cardiac toxicity. Uh, we have uh, rheumatologists. We um, also have a respiratory physician because of problems with ILD as well. So when any one of our patients experiences any sense of that maybe uh, getting some form of IRAE, we have a you know, five to 10 doctors, a team of doctors that basically focus on this. On top of that, we have a rheumatologist that's doing research on IRAEs and sort of predictive signatures as well in terms of the genomic, you know, the SNPs and, and all that. So all these patients then get go into a database that we collect in order to identify predictive markers of this sort of um, immune toxicity in the future as well. So, so that's how we've been managing our patients in our institution. Mansur, can you share the experience? Yeah, I got I completely thank you. I completely agree with David. Uh, I think one thing one should remember, uh, we were not used to, uh, we were used to chemotherapy. Now we are moving to uh, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. We should teach our patients, relatives, our staff, our young doctors, that their so toxicities can occur anytime. You can see it can coming at 16 weeks nephritis. So you have to be aware if patient is complaining of something, patient should be with us and we should treat the patient in house and not refer, refer to GP. It's our patient, we have given the toxicity and we have to manage and early, as soon as there is some toxicity, you have to react. So I completely agree what David has just mentioned. Professor Kim, can you share the experience? Yeah, I also absolutely agree uh, to uh, leaders' uh, opinion. So uh, for me, just a, a grade one and uh, grade one toxicity, just a follow up and close follow up. But uh, grade two toxicity, uh, we just uh, interrupt and uh, waiting uh, one or two weeks later, then uh, it uh, uh, recovered and uh, normalized. Then uh, we restart. But uh, grade three and four toxicity, grade three toxicity, we uh, got help from a uh, multidisciplinary system. <laughs> so uh, uh, expert in uh, each uh, toxicity, we uh, call help. So uh, that's our policy, yeah. yeah. Thank you.
Uh, this is the summary of IRA management. I, I know you are quite quite uh, know this this well. So, uh, for your summary, I can tell you again. Then, grade one is a general is a continued treatment with close monitoring, and grade two, uh, we can hold the checkpoint inhibitor therapy and consider the uh, steroid, and grade three four. Uh, we should stop the checkpoint inhibitor and uh, initiate uh, high dose steroid. That is the um, summary. And regard, in terms of IRA, the management is very important. Anti PD1 therapy is uh, li life saving treatment for some patients. So if there is a, a symptom or uh, a symptoms after treatment, then we should be suspicious for that. And second thing is we need to talk with our colleagues. I mean, consultation is important. And third thing is early intervention is very important. So if we suspicious for IRAE, then we need to start steroid and tapering slowly. In conclusion, the incidence of mortality of endometrial cancer have continued to rise worldwide immune checkpoint inhibitor as a monotherapy or in combination with TKI emerged as a treatment option for patients with previously pretreated advanced or recurrent endometrial cancer. Guidelines are now recommend immune checkpoint inhibitor as the preferred treatment in previously treated MMR deficient endometrial cancer based on deep and durable responses, low toxicity and manage manageable safety profile. Immune checkpoint inhibitor plus TKI combination has shown significant improvements in efficacy outcomes compared with single agent chemotherapy. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Thank you. I would like to hand over to Dr. Mansur Mirza. <clears throat> thank you. Great job. Thank you, and thank you to GSK for inviting me to this symposium. I apologize, you must have seen some of the slides or many of these slides before, but uh, as Shannon said, show it multiple times, then you will remember them better. Disclosures. So in March this year, the first two phase three trials were presented. Uh, we presented it at a small virtual uh, plenary and at, uh, in Tampa in SGO same day, and they were published uh, in New England Journal the same day. And that has completely changed the outcome of our patients. This is the biggest what has happened in endometrial cancer uh, since 1961 when we introduced progestin. Um, we, have, we have now uh, approach. I will talk about one approach what we, have, uh, about, uh, we are on. That is adding immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, to uh, chemotherapy. Uh, as you can see, there are four trials, four phase three trials. Three of them has already had readout. Uh, the uh, Ruby trial, part one, uh, which I will uh, take in detail, and then uh, GY018. Uh, the keynote B21 and got uh, EN11 is not uh, presented yet. Hopefully, we will see data next year and um, uh, at this Lisomap trial with attend. So three of the trials are with PD-1s, one trial is with PDL one and asking the same question in combination with chemotherapy and then monotherapy, is it going to benefit uh, the outcome? Um, these trials cannot be compared to each other uh, because they are different, uh, different, and I'll come back to that, different in many aspects. Uh, how uh, the population has been, how the endpoints are, the duration of therapy. Every, there are so many things which make it impossible uh, to have a, uh, a comparison. Uh, but they have some common uh, outcomes which are quite satisfying. So let's go to the Ruby part one trials. This was phase three trial in stage three, stage four, and first relapse uh, of patients. So st st we had made sure that we had uh, the 
so-called bad histologies with us, like carcinosarcomas, almost up to 10% of the patients have, are with carcinosarcomas. In the stage three disease, we allowed patients who had high-risk disease, like carcinosarcoma, serous cancers, these patients could uh, enter the study without uh, measurable disease. Uh, we also allowed patients who had received adjuvant therapy before and had progressed after six months of last treatment, they could enter the trial as well. Uh, I think we, we had a lot of discussion, should it be six months or 12 months, we felt that these patients have unmet need and we have to have these patients in. We randomized these patients to uh, receive uh, the carboplatin paclitaxel every three weeks, uh, six cycles, which is uh, standard of care, and on top of that, patients received dostalimab or uh, placebo every three weeks, six cycles. After that, patients continued every six weeks with monotherapy, dostalimab or placebo up to, um, up to three years. We stratified patients according to the biology, uh, if they were DMMR or they were non-DMMR, we call it MMRP, uh, if they are, uh, had prior radiation therapy and the stage of the disease, stage three, stage four, or first relapse. So the beauty of this trial is that we had a statistical design with three primary endpoints, that the trial was powered for three primary endpoints, and that is both for PFS and for OS. For PFS, we, had, uh, we looked first at the DMMR population, and if that is positive, we went over to the uh, overall population, and once that was positive, that alpha was further uh, uh, recycled to the OS, which had already half percent of the alpha. So, so three primary endpoints, both PFS and OS, uh, was a part of the study. Let's look at the results of the primary endpoints. The first primary endpoint we looked at was the DMMR population, progression-free survival in DMMR population. This is unprecedented, what we have seen. Uh, look at, first look at the, the curve, which is carboplatin paclitaxel alone uh, with placebo. You can see that at 24 months, we have only 15% of the population which is progression-free. Remember, here we have a follow-up of 25 months. And that has been increased to 61 months. Look at the shape of the curve. You have uh, progressions in the distalibab arm until 12 months, and after that, curve is completely flat, completely flat. So that is uh, uh, extremely exp uh, impressive, and the hazard ratio is 0 0.28, which is extremely uh, statistically significant and uh, meaningful. So, so this, this curve is obviously is going to transform into overall survival benefit when you see that the, the curves are flat, and I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. When we look at the second primary endpoint, which is overall survival, here again you see uh, doubling of the uh, uh, the, the progression-free survival, uh, oh, sorry, overall population, progression-free survival of overall population, you can see it is increased from 18% to 36%. Hazard ratio of 0.64, extremely statistically significant, clinically meaningful. These endpoints are final endpoints because we had uh, 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 reached uh, these endpoints clearly. Then we looked at the overall survival at that time. We had not reached the full, um, uh, full um, um, event of 50% at that time. So this, that's why these, this OS was uh, set to be premature, but look at the curves, how they start separating and keep the separation with a hazard ratio of 0.64. Uh, with increase in uh, overall survival from 56% to 71%. And, and shape of the curves, these are not banana curves, they separate all the way along. So this was the, at the time we presented data in March, 
we had the pre-planned second interim analysis, uh, which was this year, and we just, on 30th of October, saw the uh, press release from GSK that study has reached mature overall survival uh, in overall population, which is uh, the primary endpoint, the third primary endpoint with 51% events. And, and it is both statistically significant and clinically meaningful. The data, the, of course, the data is embargoed until we present it in a, a, a meeting and publish it. Uh, but this is a game changer because we have overall survival benefit from the first line treatment in our patients. Let's look at the other subgroup, which is PMMR population, how they're doing. That was pre-planned, that analysis, although alpha was not allotted. And you can see uh, that, that the hazard ratio is 0.76 uh, in the PFS. When does it transform further to further efficacy in the subsequent treatment and PFS2? Yes, it does with a hazard ratio of 0.71. And there is, again, you don't have enough uh, events, but there is a clear uh, separation of overall survival curves uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.73. So this tells us that the drug is efficacious not only to start with, but in the long term. I forgot to say in also in the primary uh, uh, OS curves, Quite many patients in placebo arm, when they progressed, they ended up receiving immune checkpoint inhibitors. So, so call it a sequential but placebo with chemotherapy and then active drug. Even then you see such a strong overall survival benefit telling us we have to push immune checkpoint inhibitors up front. That's the right place for these patients. We went ahead and did the, the analysis according to the TCGA classification. And there we divide into four groups. Uh, the upper left is the poly. You, you will be surprised to see there's only 1.25% of poly mutations in our group. Why? Because we see poly mutations in early stage, stage one, maybe stage two, 5%, 7%. But these patients doesn't progress to stage three, four. So you, it's a very small subgroup uh, of one, one, one percent. And nothing is happening there. You are giving placebo or active drug. All patients uh, are progression free. Uh, when we go to the right side, rem just remember, this is whole exome sequencing on 400 out of 494 patients. That means that hazard ratios may be a little bit different than you saw before, because this is not the total population. So keep that in mind. Uh, and, and you can see, again, a tremendous benefit in the DMMR population. Uh, and, and you see, in the PMMR population, efficacy all along, all along, the, the most surprising for me was the P53 mute population, where you see quite significant uh, increase in the PFS. Though be cautious, these analyses are non-analytical, so this gives us a hypothesis that maybe some of these uh, groups are more susceptible to immune checkpoint inhibitors than others, but we have to look at the data from other trials as well to understand what is really happening. But this is great because the P53 mute population is the worst group we have with carcinosarcomas, with serous, and, uh, and high-grade uh, endometroid, and these patients are benefiting from the, from the disease. Then we looked at the histology, and in histology you can see all histological subtypes are benefiting from the treatment. Look at the carcinosarcomas, how nicely uh, they are placed uh, quite away from uh, line of one. Numbers are small, so that's why UCCI is just crossing. So it tells us that all patients are responding uh, uh, to uh, addition of the Stalimab. So what, what is the price we are paying? We did not see any extra adverse events than we know about 
uh, about dostalima balloon or about combination of carboplatin paclitaxel. There was no extra uh, adverse event. They were immune-related re adverse events. Basically, what we saw, maybe difference was rash. Otherwise, it was uh, uh, not, not that much. Again, we saw one more thing that, that, that I think there is some, am I delayed? I have to hurry up. Okay. <laughs> so, so here uh, you see that these, the, these, most of these side effects come into chemotherapy period uh, and, and, uh, and they continue. So it's mostly in that period, but we don't see uh, extra higher side effects of any kind. I love this slide. We did the patient reported outcomes and we reported the Q-twist data. The middle curve, the middle one, the part, twist, uh, is the survival without toxicity. So you remove the toxicity part and you can see how much benefit we are giving these patients without toxicity. So this is a, a, a great achievement that you get unprecedented improvement in uh, outcome as efficacy with a better patient reported outcome. Second trial which, I, which was presented was NRG018. Uh, same design, stage three, four, uh, and first relapse patients, uh, and, 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 and uh, I miss carcinosarcomas here, and another difference is that at 12 months uh, uh, you should have if you had received adjuvant uh, therapy. Uh, patients are randomized to carboplatin paclitaxel plus uh, pembrolizumab or placebo, uh, and then mono placebo up to uh, two years. Uh, and, and chemotherapy could have extended, been extended to 10 cycles. Primary endpoints are PFS, both in DMMR and PMMR population. So here, uh, we, do not, we would not be able to see the efficacy as overall survival is uh, concerned. We see the same curves, same beautiful curves. The difference is here uh, follow-up is very short. Uh, so you have uh, uh, very short follow-up. Uh, that's why it's, it's, it's difficult to see what is happening on the other. So we have to see more follow-up in order to get the real picture out of that, but you see the similar curves both in the DMMR and in PMR, uh, PMMR population. Uh, I think the very nice data we saw uh, in ESMO a few days ago was the methylation data in the DMMR population showing that there is no difference if patient has mutation or not. They are all responding to that. And this is prospective analysis, so one should believe that the, the other retrospective, the small data which had before uh, would not count. When we look at the toxicity profile, it, somewhat the same toxicity, it, we will never have a, a will right to compare between trials, but I would say that, that uh, the drug is manageable uh, and uh, it, is, uh, mm, uh, it has some extra toxicity, but quite, quite manageable in the uh, in the case. So here you see the differences. That's why we cannot compare these trials. First, the patients who had received adjuvant therapy, if they had progressed after six months, they could enter the, uh, the, the RUBY trial, but they had to pro progress after 12 months to enter the uh, GY018 trial. Uh, the uh, primary endpoints in RUBY trial are both PFS and OS, while in the, uh, in the GY01 trial is PFS, both for DMMR and PMMR population. The treatment duration is different. Now we have more trials, so we have three different durations, two years, three years, until progression of disease. So that is also difference. Performance status, uh, there was a difference in, uh, I think, histology. Carcinosarcomas were not included in the GY018 trial, where we have about 10% of carcinosarcomas. Cycles, six cycles in both, uh, but, but in the GY0, the chemotherapy cycles, but GY018, you could extend it up to 10 cycles, as I uh, explained. Then very important that we have 
the patient reported outcome data, very thorough data available uh, in uh, Ruby trial. It is in all patients here you have uh, in MMRP population in the GY018 trial. Further, if you look at the, uh, that, it's, it, it's not to compare against each other, it's the differences. Because of these differences, we cannot compare these, these results. I would say uh, that the statistical design in GY018 was the old one that you have two separate cohorts running, one in DMMR and one, and you power for each. And we had hierarchical design with half of the percent alpha given to OS and 2% given to PFS in DMMR, recycled to overall population and then recycled to OS. Um, so so there, are, there are difference all the way along and that's why you, you must not compare between these trials uh, to each other. Let's go to the third trial which was presented in ESMO a few uh, weeks ago uh, by Nicoletta, uh, which is NGOT EN7 ATTEN trial. This trial has used, uh, so the first two trials have used PD-1, dostalimab or pembrolizumab. This trial has used a PDL one which is a tezolizumab. I don't know what does that mean. We would never uh, understand it. But that this is a, a, a PDL one and otherwise the population is more or less the same, stage three, stage four disease, first relapse. The difference in this trial would be that there are no, quite a lot of Asian population also added. So that was not the case that much in the other two trials. Otherwise, there are not uh, uh, many things to say that patients were uh, randomized to carboplatin paclitaxel plus a TESO versus placebo and continued a TESO or placebo as monotherapy until progression of disease, not two or three years until progression of disease. Again, primary endpoints here are PFS and OS, which is important uh, uh, in this trial. When we look at the DMMR, I think if I put these DMMR curves on, not, on top of each other, you would not guess which one is what, which one. It's beautiful. Hazard ratio is uh, 0 0.4, um, I, 0 0.36, 0 0.36, and uh, there, uh, there is a fourth trial which has 0 0.42, so I'm a little bit uh, mixing that. And, and again, you see, uh, you see a nice separation in the DMMR population. When we look at the PFS in intention to treat population, again, you see a benefit in, uh, in the intention to treat population uh, and, and hazard ratio is uh, 0 0.74. However, in this trial, when we look, uh, and the overall survival is not mature yet, so it's difficult to uh, say anything right now. However, when we saw the subgroup analysis of PMMR, we did not see any, any, any benefit. Regarding uh, uh, toxicity, um, again, quite manageable uh, drug. It was uh, taken well, and there was no uh, extra toxicity, what we have seen with the tezolizumab or carboplatin paclitaxel. All in all, addition of PD-1s or pdl ones uh, to standard of care chemotherapy in patients with primary advanced recurrent and mitral cancer resulted in substantial unprecedented benefit uh, in patients with DMMR population in all trials attend Ruby Energy uh, GY018. Benefit was also observed in the patients with MMRP population with NTPDL1 plus uh, chemotherapy with meaningful, NTPD-1 with meaningful uh, uh, improvement. We didn't see that in the NTPDL-1 therapy. The tolerability profile uh, of this combination is consistent. What is established, uh, uh, safety profile of the individual drugs, and immune therapy with dostalimab in combination with chemotherapy has demonstrated survival gain with a higher quality of life versus chemotherapy alone. Molecular data from Ruby and NIG018 are building up. We are learning more and hopefully we will have 
a more granularity in the Australian time to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mansur. Uh, just uh, we have only uh, five minutes of the discussion. So just I would like to ask you, uh, how are you currently managing patients with uh, advanced recurrent endometrial cancer patient currently? So, uh, so the, the, because of this, this data, the uh, GSK decided to submit first the DMMR uh, for approval. Uh, FDA has given approval. Uh, UK has given approval. In European Medicine Agency, we have positive CHMP opinion, so it's a matter of weeks. Uh, we, in many of our, our countries, have ability to prescribe uh, the triplet of chemotherapy plus dastalimab uh, in different ways, uh, 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 an individual basis. So as soon as we have approval, that will be the standard of care. So in DMMR, it is clear that it is today's standard of care. Now that we have overall survival data, which is uh, significant, uh, I hope soon that GSK will submit for the whole population on the both sides of the pond, and we will see uh, approval there, so we will be able to treat patients, all patients with treatment. Okay. Just one more question is, uh, what safety concern uh, about uh, the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor plus combination of chemotherapy? We did not see any improved uh, uh, toxicity profile of combining the, the drugs. We have now, in my center, we have uh, quite many patients. Also, we are having trials in ovarian cancer. So, so we have and really many patients, and it, it seems... I mean, we saw this graph, and we have to be careful, but the toxicity profile is extremely manageable, so we didn't see any, any serious okay. issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, lastly, uh, do all MMR-deficient uh, patients need chemotherapy? Uh, we do not have uh, answers, just... Uh, uh, it's, it's a little bit... Uh, that's the obvious next question. Yeah. Uh, we are in the phase of doing two randomized right. trials in the DMMR patients, right. where patients are being randomized to chemotherapy alone versus uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor alone, the PD-1. Okay. In one trial, in Dominica trial, you can see it's the Stalimab. In the uh, uh, NGOTN-15 trial, it's Pembrolizumab. I believe that we would see the outcome of these uh, uh, trials in maybe in 25. And at that time, if we see this benefit, I would not treat my patients with, with, with chemotherapy. It's difficult if, if you have similar huge benefit, uh, why patients should lose hair. Okay. <laughs> okay, Dr. David, a little bit hurry. Yes. <laughs> Right, okay, so I get to the tail end of this, which is what are you going to do after you've exhausted all your immunotherapies and you're <laughs> thinking to yourself, um, have I got any other options for my patients? But before that, um, yeah, I'm going to, my, my topic today is about whether we should be combining <laughs> immunotherapy with PARP inhibitors or uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors beyond. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> what we are currently doing for patients of uh, advanced recurrent endometrial cancer. So, these are my disclosures. Right, so uh, the rationale for combining PARP inhibitors and PDL1 inhibitors is simply that when you use a PARP inhibitor, you cause DNA fragmentation, and that leads to upregulation of the C gasting pathway and upregulation of interferon uh, based cytokines that activate the immune system within the microenvironment, bring in the T cells, and potentially can augment what you're already doing with a PD-1 or PDL one inhibitor. Uh, of course, you must remember that this, it, it, currently the studies that have looked at this is in the context of patients who've received chemotherapy with immunotherapy. So potentially you have chemotherapy that might already be transforming this cancer microenvironment to something a bit more hot. Then you're hoping that with the PARP inhibitor, you can further augment the heat uh, in these tumors. Um, the duo E study was examining exactly that. So the question they asked was if you had the same patient population as you saw with 
uh, GY018, as with um, uh, Ruby, as with A10, and these were stage three or four patients with primary recurrent advanced ovarian cancer. And you then, instead of just giving them IO with chemo, what if you give IO with chemo followed by IO plus a PARP inhibitor as a maintenance arm? Compa and then what they also did was they did the DERVA plus carboplatin and plaquetaxel followed by DERVA maintenance, and finally they had the placebo arm. Now, the statistical analysis was not comparing the PARP inhibitor plus IO arm against IO, both of the experimental arms were compared against the placebo maintenance. So it's very difficult to make conclusions about whether there was superiority of one experimental arm over the other, but what you can at least glean from this is whether the uh, experimental arms are better than the control. And this was the result in the PFS in the IIT population, ITT population. And what you saw was that both arms were superior to placebo maintenance, but importantly, when they broke this up into the DMMR and PMMR populations, the majority of the benefit in the DERVA and DERVA Olaprip DMMR patients was similar. So the, the, the benefit from the addition of Olaprip to development versus development was very similar against placebo in the DMMR population. But where the benefit seemed to be coming from with the addition of a PARP inhibitor was in that PMMR population where the PFS was longer then Valamap and PMMR, but again, because it was not statistically powered to compare the Valamap Olaprip versus Valamap, again, it is inconclusive about the relative benefit of one over the other. What we can say is that it does appear that by adding a Olaprip to Valamap, you have a better advantage over placebo and uh, alone for maintenance. But I think before this becomes adopted as standard of care, we do need to understand a bit more within that PMR population who are the patients that are actually benefiting from the addition of a PARP inhibitor. So there was some evidence that the PDL1 expression could be a discriminator, but of course, PDL1 expression cuts across both DMMR and PMMR populations. So we need to know what's happening in PDL1 positive PMMR, and on top of that, what happens when you then bring in this question of HRD? P53 mutation, and those are the questions that we still haven't got answers to in this particular study. But certainly provocative and very interesting to look forward to the subsequent translational analysis that might help us to understand the value of a PARP inhibitor in these patients. So the summary of the endpoints in terms of safety, I think they were what you would expect with the addition of um, a chemotherapy followed by a, a immunotherapy, as, as you see with the uh, DERVA maintenance arm. With the addition of Olaparib, uh, the grade three AEs were numerically slightly higher. Uh, and in terms of the outcomes of death, actually not much different. Uh, compared uh, to the chemotherapy and other maintenance phases. Uh, and even in the co context of the MDS-AML story, there was really no difference with the addition of Olaparib uh, versus the non-Olaparib arms. Uh, again, no difference in new primary malignancies, but we did see a slight signal of more pneumonitis. And this has been seen before in PARP inhibitors. When you give a PARP inhibitor, some patients develop pneumonitis. And so when you have IO plus PARP, I think you must consider that you may get a higher uh, uh, um, percentage and risk of pneumonitis in these patients as well. So then we, we know that there are other studies that are going to explore this combination of a PARP inhibitor plus immunotherapy, and this is Ruby 2, and this is a two to one randomized design. Again, same uh, population of patients that we've talked about before, but this time uh, dostalamab plus chemotherapy followed by dostalamab plus niraparib versus placebo. So I think again, when we look forward to the answers in this study, we will be asking the same questions that we asked when we saw the results from DUO-E. Who are the patients that are really benefiting from the addition of a PARP inhibitor in these populations? In terms of TKI and PDL1 inhibitors, I think the first thing to say is that TKI is a huge umbrella term. There are lots of different types of TKIs. But I guess the point of using a TKI is in some way being able to change the microenvironment in a way that makes it favorable for immunotherapy to work. But TKIs can work in two ways. You can change, the TKI itself could affect the microenvironment, but the TKI could also have a direct effect on the cell, and we'll talk about that a bit later. But the one TKI that we are most familiar with is probably lenvatinib, because we've been using it now in our practice in the context of recurrent uh, IO-naive PMMR cancers who get pembrolenvatinib uh, after progression on carboplatin and taxol.
And of course, we are waiting for the data from LEAP-001, which is the first-line study combining, uh, comparing the pembrolambatinib combination versus chemotherapy uh, as, uh, as, as a control. So we know, as we talked about the Keynote 775, which is in a recurrent setting, which clearly demonstrated median PFS benefit as well as overall survival benefit. Uh, and uh, this is, as you know now, a standard of care for us, uh, for patients who progress in first-line uh, carbotaxol. And of course, that is all going to change now uh, because all of our patients may potentially get first-line IO in light of the data from uh, Ruby and GY018. Um, we know that in the uh, Keynote 775, there were concerns about uh, adverse events uh, related to the use of lenvatinib. And you can see there's certainly higher grade three adverse events with the addition of lenvatinib to immunotherapy. And I think anyone who has treated your patients with lenvatinib will recognize this is quite a tough regimen. And you need to keep your patient, a close eye on your patients and dose reduce fairly quickly if patients have difficulty tolerating this drug. So LEAP will hopefully now tell us whether or not you can use a chemo-free regimen versus carbotaxol. But remember that carbotaxol in itself, in terms of the response rate, was pretty high in all the previous studies. But what was the difference was even after carbotaxol on those control arms of all the prior primary IO studies that we've seen, is that after four months of chemotherapy, those curves start dropping. So the question is whether by using a pembrolol and Vima combination, even if the response is not the same as chemo, are you more likely to maintain the disease control for longer, even as the patients on the chemo arm start dropping off in terms of the progression-free survival? So this is going to be an interesting study, but I think, crucially, it's going to be, again, the question of who benefits from pembrolenvima versus chemotherapy. So all of that is going to read out, and if all that reads out as positive, we're going to have a big problem. You and I are going to look at each other and say, I've got a patient who's progressed in IO, what am I going to do next? I think the first question we've got to ask ourselves is, is there a role for rechallenging patients, re patients with IO? And we've seen this happen in a lot of other tumor types that respond well to immunotherapy, and then when they progress, you give them immunotherapy again, they respond again. Melanoma, renal cell carcinoma. Does this happen in endometrial cancer? Well, I think you need to look at endometrial cancer post-IO in three separate categories. You have the long patients who have completed their IO and then have had a long period of disease control and subsequently relapse. And that's very different than the patients that are on IO and then progress. So you can call IO refractory if you like. And then finally, there are the patients that received the IO, got pneumonitis, didn't do very well with that treatment, so I had to stop. Then when they recover from that toxicity and then there's progression, can you rechallenge those patients with IO as well? And the choice of rechallenge therapy will be interesting as well. Is it okay to go back to your single agent IO or should you be combining these patients with a TKI? So there was some data that has looked at this. This is a single center data that was reported by Morton and colleagues, and they looked at patients with prior IO exposure who were then re-challenged with IO upon progression. Now, the problem with this data is that we don't really know what the context of the prior IO exposure and the progression-free interval was. But in any case, you see that a lot of these patients were DMMR patients, and the subsequent response rate with rechallenge of IO was about 54.5%, which is pretty high. Uh, also note that there were quite a, a few patients where the, uh, the TMB status was known that was high as well, as you'd expect, I guess, with a, a DMMR population. So I think at least this goes to show that there is scope to rechallenge patients, but I suspect that these patients for me, will be the ones that have had a good response to IO before and then had a long interval before they progressed again, or patients who potentially have had a toxicity, recovered from that, and now your immunologist says it's okay to try again. And we have some anecdotal data, and this was a case study pr uh, that was published from a Chinese center about a patient who started off receiving uh, immunotherapy treatment uh, with a sort of VEGF uh, receptor, multi-kinase inhibitor with a PD-1 inhibitor, and then develop really bad uh, immunotoxicity with uh, interstitial pneumonitis, but subsequently recovered from that with good treatment, and then on progression was re-challenged with a an anti different anti-PD-1 inhibitor, and 
eventually developed a partial response. So I think these are also the patients that we will be seeing a lot of. And this also means we need to work more closely with our multidisciplinary teams managing immunotoxicity when you start considering re-challenging these patients with immunotherapy as well. There is one piece that is not very well understood at this point, but there's quite a lot of data on this, in that when you have a tumor and you're trying to kill that tumor, you need the tumor to be able to tell the immune system that I'm abnormal. And that's part of what the PD-1, PD-L1 axis is trying to disguise. And that's what we're trying to break with PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors. But even if you've got the PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitor, but you're unable to present the antigen to the surface of the cell, that's all going to be for naught. And we know that there are specific mechanisms that cells can use to hide the antigens and disrupt the HLA processing machinery. So HLA, uh, so if you have peak 3 ca upregulation or RAS activation, you can actually cause these proteins that present these antigens to be absorbed within the cell or, pre pre or hinder the interferon upregulation of these HLA machinery that helps to present antigen on the cell surface. And just to say that the HLA molecules are composed of two parts. There's a heavy polymorphic chain, the alpha head chain, encoded by HLAA, B, and C. And in fact, in certain tumors, like in lung, like in cervical cancer, we see HLAA and B actually mutated, lost in the tumor. So you lose the ability to present antigen to the surface. And then you have the light chain, the beta microglobulin, which has also been found to be mutated in cancers as well. So you can see how the entire process can be disrupted in cancers. And then when we look at the TCGA data, and everyone likes to focus on the molecular subtypes, but when you look actually in terms of the individual mutations that affect the cells, you begin to see that there are specific pathways that are actually relevant to HLA dysregulation that have also been disrupted in this process. Upregulation of PIK3CA pathway, for example, KRAS mutations. So these could, in a way, impact on the way we're able to get these responses uh, to immunotherapy in some of these DMMR and PMMR patients as well. And I think that's why when we look at the subgroup analysis and translational analysis, these are all going to be very important questions to ask. So in our institution, we're running a study that's actually trying to find a solution to this, which is whether or not when you do a triplet combination by inhibiting the PIK3CA pathway to basically improve HLA processing, but also to downregulate T regulatory cells in the microenvironment, combining that with a PARP inhibitor and immunotherapy, will that work if you select the right patients with these PIK3CA pathway mutations? So this was data we presented at ASMO last year, and if you look at the top list of tumors that were breast and gynae with known PIK3CA mutations, you're beginning to see that we are seeing some very long and sustained uh, patients with disease control uh, with this triplet combination, and we are now expanding that to recruit more gynae patients with this uh, particular PIK3CA or AKT mTOR pathway aberrations. So what other targets are being evaluated? Um, I think we've seen a lot of data now that is an exciting time for endometrial cancer. We know you can target uh, HER2 expressing endometrial cancers of TDXD. We have this question about whether you can now enhance P53 wild-type uh, apoptotic pathways in P53 wild-type tumors uh, with the Selinexor study to prevent export of P53 from the nucleus or targeting the MDM2 E3 ubiquitin ligase pathway that prevent TP53 downregulation and so enable it to induce apoptosis as well. Then we have the uh, endocrine therapy studies and combining that with CDK4-6 inhibitors which are known to mediate resistance to endocrine therapy in these tumors. We've really seen interesting data from the paleo study. Then we've also got the ADCs, alpha folate receptor inhibition, uh, with very, very interesting data in terms of um, um, the response that we've seen with TDXD, but now we're looking at the, the whether or not targeting folate receptor alpha can also give us similar results. And likewise, with TROP2 ADCs, we've already seen some preliminary data presented in ASCO uh, uh, last, uh, this year, actually, showing a response rate of about 33% in high-expressing TROP2 uh, endometrial cancers. So in conclusion, um, DUO-E, as we know, is the first phase three trial that's looked at PARP inhibitor plus immunotherapy in the context of recurrent advanced endometrial cancer with statistically, Im improvement, uh, statistically significant improvement of the combination in PMMR patients. But I think we need a bit more granularity in terms of understanding who really benefits from these treatments. Ruby 2 is also going to complete 
and give us hopefully more answers. But I think we really need to start looking forward now to more of these targeted treatments, but actually more specifically how we can really start to subdivide and focus on the right biomarkers to treat the right patients in this evolving age of endometrial cancer therapy. With that, thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, uh, uh, given the positive results for partnering between endometrial cancer like DOE, uh, how do we decide with, uh, uh, which combination treatment is best uh, for which patient? Do, do you think uh, which biomarker, specific biomarker, uh, uh, yeah. maybe identify responders? It's very Department difficult. Interest. Yeah, I, I think that's a really, really in good question, but very uh, a question that we still don't have answers to. <laughs> I think we have some s data to suggest that P53 mutant endometrial cancers may be the ones that are, might be a good surrogate marker for HRD in endometrial cancer, but actually we, we really don't have enough data to support that at this yeah. point. So I would really like to see in the dual E population, what are the P53 mutant population actually doing in that PMMR group of patients, and I hope that when we see the Ruby 2 data come out as well, we will have some granularity about that, because that will probably give us more information about how best to manage the maintenance part of this, these patients. And this is also because we are uh, not ready to, val we don't have a validated HID test for endometrial cancer. Mm -hmm. I think that would be the best surrogate we have is P53 until we have something better to analyze. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Mansur. Uh, uh, what is the, the role of the PARP inhibitor in uh, endometrial cancer patients? I think <laughs> David has very nicely uh, shown the, the rationale. And I, I, I'm definite that there, there is a subpopulation uh, of endometrial yeah. cancer where you will see uh, uh, the addition of PARP inhibitor on top of immune checkpoint inhibitor do have efficacy. If, if there are other mechanisms of, of, of synergy that would also uh, help us with the rest of the population, we don't know. I think we have to wait to have the results of Ruby 2 as well and have the granularity which are the patients who are responding before. But I definitely believe that there will be a subpopulation where we would see uh, efficacy of the drug. Uh, and uh, we are now have uh, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors in first line setting and second line setting all together. Then, uh, what do you think of the uh, appropriate sequence? <laughs> well, I think I, I tried to answer that uh, question when I showed you the overall survival data. Then, uh, overall survival data in Ruby, which is uh, statistically significant, these patients who were in placebo. Uh, about one third, more than one third of the patients upon progression received uh, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor with or without lymphatinib, right? And still you see a clear benefit in overall survival. We have to wait for more information when we also have the PFS2 data, we can look at uh, the, uh, how they are doing, but uh, I believe the right place for immune checkpoint inhibitors is up front and not wait for relapse. Yeah, I, I think just to emphasize the point that I think if it becomes the case that we do see sort of uh, impact on immunotherapy across the board for all patients with endometrial cancer, I think the big question now is what to do next. I and I think the ability to identify those molecular profiles to actually now with all the targeted treatments we have in, in, in lieu you know, of the, the HER2 status, TROP2 status, those are the things that are gonna be yeah. extremely important to establish for all our patients who are on uh, IO treatment on the basis that our progression, we need to know what to do for them next. Yeah. Echo with David, uh, chemotherapy plus IO will be future backbone yes. for the study. So we can add on by the molecular subtype or biomarker and we can more improve our outcomes more. Absolutely. I th yeah. For DMMR, it's no brainer. Yeah. For PMMR, we need some more granularity, but now we see the first data, which is positive, in also in overall survival. So, answer is yes. Okay. Uh, Jung Yun-Li, uh, are there any Asian uh, <laughs> study, trials, <laughs> would you like uh, to highlight? <laughs> so, uh, 
many of us uh, Asian and some of my, my colleagues uh, concerns about the activity of immune checkpoint inhibitor in Asian population because NRG GI 18 and uh, Ruby study, there are few Asian and attend and uh, DOE study. Uh, it is subgroup analysis, but uh, the, uh, the trend of benefit was uh, Asian, Asian population have less benefit from immunotherapy. So uh, MMR deficient, we have no doubt, but uh, non-MMR patient or other subgroups, we have some uh, concerns. However, uh, so Just to push yeah, we, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce my uh, DOB study. Uh, EPGOT OV7 and GOT OV80, which is investigated initiated study with GSK. And this is, this patient targets for uh, clear cell carcinoma uh, from gynecological origin. Uh, in Asia, many clear cell carcinoma patients, there are huge amount need for this patient subpopulation, patient group and recurrent uh, clear cell carcinoma, we randomize one to one to one fashion. Arm one will be dostalimab, arm B will be dostalimab plus bevacizumab, and arm C will be uh, physician's choice chemotherapy. And, and from arm A and arm C, we'll allow the crossover to arm B. So, and primary endpoint will be investigate to access the progression-free survival. And, um, Please keep an eye, your eye on this study and uh, uh, join this study. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for your wonderful, fantastic uh, discussions. Just for conclusion, uh, yeah, in summary, uh, my colleagues today have uh, summarized the pivotal uh, clinical trials comparing uh, to the three E's, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors in endometrial cancer. You remember uh, emergence and uh, evolution and uh, expansion. So Dr. Lee presented two case studies and uh, encapsulating the emergence of treatment in uh, data from Garnet and Keynote 158 and Keynote 775 trials. And Dr. Mirza updated us on uh, evolutionary uh, breakthroughs of the year, Ruby Part 1 and GYO18, uh, along with the uh, recent data released uh, at uh, ESMO 22.3 attended trial, and Dr. Uh, David Tan gave us uh, some glimpse into uh, upcoming expansion of the uh, treatment options that may be available uh, for our patient with uh, the results of DOO, Medipac, and other uh, targets that are being evaluated. So at this point, we have, not, we have heard a lot about uh, development of immune uh, checkpoint uh, inhibitors and their use in uh, endometrial cancer. We now have approval of the immunotherapy in uh, first line, which is a fantastic opportunity uh, for our patients in the United States and United Kingdom with a positive champ uh, opinion in the European Union in uh, mid-October. Uh, yeah, as immunotherapy moves earlier in the treatment paradigm, ongoing questions that are uh, continuing to be evaluated uh, include new combinations such as incorporation of the PARP inhibitor and the implications that uh, entails a new, t new agents uh, which really uh, introduce a new era in the treatment of endometrial cancer. Uh, thank you so much uh, and for your time. Uh, please take time to complete the uh, evaluation uh, by scanning the QR code, please. Yeah. Uh, this will lead you a brief survey to provide uh, 
valuable feedback to the sponsor and enhance future events. We now look for the questions from audience. Is there any uh, question or? <laughs> Just we have 10 minutes. <laughs> OK? Yeah. Then, uh, yeah, we think uh, we will close uh, this session. Thanks so much. <laughs>